Today we're talking about he heard. So a little bit of background about me and something you may not know. So my dad was born deaf, and uh, he and his twin were born premature, and so they had a nerve deafness from birth. And over time, my dad's hearing got progressively worse, and by the time I was a young adult, he almost was not able to talk with us. Uh, he, couldn't, he couldn't hear the kids, even when Lily was little, he, just, he didn't even bother to talk with them because he couldn't hear. And uh, what's interesting is that he went and got a cochlear implant, and it changed his life forever. He, he started hearing sounds he'd never heard before in his life. He was in the grocery store, and he's hearing this crackling. He's asking my mom, what is that racket? What's going on? What's going, is this place falling down? He was like, like concerned that something was wrong with the building, and it was he'd never heard a sack before. He did that sound of sacks, just drove him crazy. It took him some time to get used to it. But the point is, is over time, God, God gave him an opportunity that he had a new device and he was able to hear. Sometimes I think we all look at our own lives and we're talking to God. Sometimes we wonder if he hears us. We wonder if he's listening to us. You know, it's interesting, everybody that raises animals here knows. I don't care whether it's a cow, goat, chickens. Those babies know their moms. And their moms know the baby's cry. They just do. You can have 50 cows out there, and one calf cries out, and the moms come. The mom knows. They can hear it. And as hard as it is for us to understand, in this huge world, with jillions of people, God knows every one of our distinct voices, and He hears every one of us. And it's hard to imagine, yet go out and watch. Watch the animals in the pasture. Watch the baby curse. And you get to see this. You're going to see these little guys have a special language. It's even kind of funny because, you know, you try and you know, move animals around, and the moms always know. They smell them. They hear them. They know and sometimes they'll be kind enough to adopt a baby. But they, but they know. They know the voice. They, they know what they're hearing. It's easy for us when things are hard, when life is bogging our ears down and everything's going on around us, to think that our voice is getting lost in the crowd. But it's just simply not true. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Because God knows distress. And I don't care what... Any animal we talk about, any animal knows the stress. Talk about humans. We even know our own kids' cries. It doesn't take long before you recognize the certain voice, even the giggle when they're in the mischief, <laughs> or when they're calling out for help, or when they're looking for something. It's there. So if you look at Psalm chapter 66, verses 16 through 20, it says, Come and hear, all you that fear God. And I will declare what he hath done for my soul. I cried unto him with my mouth, and he was extolled with my tongue. Say, God, God heard me. God heard me. It's so easy for us to lose sight of that. And I'm going to say it a hundred times today because he hears us. He is listening to us. It's hard to accept sometimes, believe it or not, you probably have never experienced this, but you may have a young child that's standing there, he's tapping your hip. Mom, mom, yes, okay, mom, mom, I'm here, I hear you, yes, I've answered it. Mom, but I asked about, and it almost becomes obnoxious, and I'm sure no parents ever experienced that or gotten frustrated with the kid for, yes, would you stop asking? <laughs> but that's exactly what we do to God. It's exactly what we do. God, God. God, are you, because if we don't see something tangible in front of us, it's difficult for us to believe that he heard us. One of the things that we have to understand is we're going to go through today realizing that he's heard us and he even heard us before we asked. And he cares about our needs before we even ask. And so sometimes when it feels like there's no light on the horizon and nothing's coming our way, truly, there is light. There is something there. There's something for us. And so it goes on 
to say, But verily, God hath heard me. He hath attended to the voice of my prayer. Blessed be God, which hath not turned away my prayer, nor his mercy from me. What a beautiful, beautiful moment to say, Wow, he did hear me. Now, it's easy for us to do that when we can look in hindsight. Say, well, five years ago, I prayed for such and such, and it happened. And da, 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 da. Those are always easy, and those are always nice. It's a prayer that you're in. You know, what's the hardest time of prayer, or the hardest need that you have? What's the need you have right now? <laughs> it's easy for us to forget about last week or last year, or five years ago. And we're, we're constantly looking at what, what it is we have right now. What's going on in our life right now? What's bothering us right now? But God hears us. Sometimes we feel these prayers pass in the wind. Sometimes I've even heard people say, and I've even felt it myself, is God too busy? Is he just not? Because I just don't feel like there's a, a lack of attention that's coming my way. And the other thing that really, really is sad is that people feel like you have to have a certain level of righteousness to have your prayers answered. The Bible does talk about being righteous. It does talk about when you're in a good standing and not to <clears throat> have your prayers hindered by certain behaviors. But what we're going to look at today is really, regardless of where you stand, he didn't turn a deaf ear to you. And you don't have to be some special phenomenon because you're already that special. And it's easy for us to forget that. So when we look at the, our prayers, sometimes people feel like God is almost conditional. Do I have to do this, this, and this? I constantly say he's not a respecter of this equation. It's not 2 plus 2 equals 4. If I do this and I do this, then God will give me this. It's not the way it always goes. And there's story after story in the Bible that points that out. But I do want to talk about Abraham. I'm going to go to Genesis chapter 17. We're going to go through verses 1 through 9. Then we're going to skip over a few because it's all about the circumcision. We don't really need to get into that. And then we're going to go from 15 to 21. So again, Genesis chapter 17, verses 1 through 9 and verses 15 through 21. So this is bringing into perspective. Now, God had already promised Abraham that he was going to have a son. And so Abraham, unlike anybody in this room, decided to help God out and figured that because his wife couldn't have a baby, he would use his maidservant and then they would be able to have a baby. And that worked out. They were able to have a baby. God didn't condemn this child, but God said, this wasn't my best for you. This wasn't what I had planned for you. Believe it or not, we all sometimes want to help God out. You know, there's always that saying, people say, God helps those who help themselves. And there's definitely truth to that. You have to do something. You can't always just expect God to, to just feed you while you just lay on the ground and expect food to just fall in your mouth. But the point is, is Abraham stepped a little into disobedience. Why do I want to point that out? Because God still heard the cry of his heart. He didn't have to do a bunch of things to make that right. So, starting in, in uh, chapter 17, verse 1, it says, And when Abram was 90 years old, now obviously his name hadn't been changed yet, so bear with me. The Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I'm the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. And I will make my covenant between me and thee, and will multiply thee exceedingly. And Abraham fell on his face, and God talked with him, <coughs> saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father of many nations. So he goes on to say, Neither shall thy name be any more called Abram, but thou, thy name shall be Abraham. For a father of many nations have I made thee. And I will make thee exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee, and I will establish my covenant between me and thee, and thy seed after thee, and their generation, generations for an everlasting covenant, to be a God unto thee, and to thy seed after thee. 
and I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession. I will be their God. And God said unto <laughs> Abraham, Thou shalt keep my covenant, therefore thou and thy seed after thee and their generations. So Abraham has a moment with God. Now, this wasn't his first moment with God. This wasn't his first revelation. God's taken him here. He takes him to a tender spot and he says, I am going to honor my promise. I am going to be making you great. You ever felt like you're still holding on to a promise? Like I haven't seen it happen yet? And it's coming. If God put a promise and God showed you a promise in your heart, you've got to be holding on to it. Don't give up on that promise. And don't feel like you have to become something magnificent for that promise to come to fruition. God does not expect that. He asks us to be obedient. But he's not going to withhold himself from you. Think of it like a child. We all love our kids. We do. We love our kids. And if you have your child and they bust the window, are you all of a sudden going to stop feeding them? That's it. You broke a window. You didn't get no. No. You don't withhold your provision from them. You don't withhold your love. Do they maybe get a consequence? Do they maybe get some chores? That's possible. Sometimes you might even extend them grace and not even worry about it. And that's all up to you. It's the same way God works. But he's not expecting all of a sudden to just completely ostracize you from him. He doesn't want that. Everything that's in the Bible is about having a relationship. Having a, a, a spirit-filled, heart-filled life where you're longing for Christ, where you're hungry for Him. You're together with Him. The last thing He wants to do is push you away. We know that with our own kids. If you start ostracizing, go, go be in your room for 10 hours. You've taken them away from you. It's one thing to have a moment of of peace. We all need that as well. But the point I'm saying is, is you're not going to shove your kids away and no longer communicate with them. You desire a relationship. You want the interaction. And God does too. So he's sitting here telling Abraham. Now Abraham had a son. This son wasn't God's best for him. And God's still sitting here telling him, this is what I'm going to do for you. I'm going to make you great. You're going to be a father of nations. You're going to have all sorts of people after you. Now, it's easy for us to look back a couple thousand years ago or better. It's easy for us to look back and well, yeah, I mean, and, and he was great and this all. But wait a second, look at our own life. We're just asking for a miracle for next week. That's hard enough to ask for. Can you put yourself in Abraham's shoes right there? It doesn't say it. It doesn't say it. But I think if I were in Abraham's shoes at that point in time, I would be trying to figure out in my head how my son Ishmael was going to make me a nation. <laughs> That's what I would be thinking. And I'd be saying, Father, I receive it, Lord. I, I hear what you're saying about my son. I accept this. This is good. Okay? I can do this. He's listening to what he's going to do and how this is going to happen. And in Abraham's mind, this is coming from Ishmael, his son, that he helped God out with. And then God says, now I jump to verse 15. <laughs> and God said unto Abraham, As for Sarai thy wife, thou shalt not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall her name be. And I will bless her, and give thee a son also of her. Yea, I will bless her. Notice he has to say it a couple of times, because I think he knows that Abraham's not listening. I, right, I'm just saying, and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of people shall be of her. And Abraham, right then and there, the godly man that he is with God, he's having this moment with God. He's enjoying it. He falls to his face and he starts laughing. You got to be kidding me. You told me this 10 years ago. <laughs> I helped you out. Sarah can't have a kid. We've tried this. Been there, done that, got a t-shirt. It's not happening. It's not happening. 
And he's, he's broken hearted. It's not that he's just laughing because this is funny. He's laughing because he doesn't believe it. I'm not here to judge that. Because I've been in those shoes. I've been in that spot. But I'm like, God, <laughs> I don't know if this will ever happen for me. I don't know if this will ever work out. I don't see it. I don't see it on the horizon. We talk about the spiritual, the supernatural, and the natural. And we, sometimes when we're looking at it in the natural, we almost can't even conceive what's happening in the supernatural. We all have stories that we could talk about where we're like, absolutely, I know this was a miracle from God. Because I couldn't figure this out in my mind. I need peace in my mind. I, I couldn't figure it out. And somehow, out of left field, God did X. And I wasn't expecting it. And so here Abraham, standing here, and he's going, <laughs> a little left field. We've been here, we've tried this, and this doesn't work. It hasn't worked. I can hear his frustration going, God, when are you showing up? You told me this 10 years ago. How am I supposed to believe that? It doesn't say it in the Bible. It doesn't say it anywhere in there. But I believe that there must have been something because God's going to give him a period certain, so sit tight. But this is what he goes on to say after he laughs. Shall a child be born unto him that is a hundred years old? That's kind of old. I would say it has to be supernatural. And shall Sarah, that is 90 years old, bear? So Abraham said unto God, This Right here is the heart of a father. This is the heart of a parent. See, everybody takes Isaac, and we talk about Isaac, and Isaac was born to Abraham in the Bible, blah, 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 blah. This all happened. It wasn't God's best. Isaac was the seed of Abraham to build the nations and all this stuff. It doesn't say anywhere that Abraham didn't love Ishmael. And I'm betting based on what he's about to say, he absolutely adored that child. And he was special to him. And maybe he helped God out, but it didn't mean that the child wasn't blessed. And it didn't mean that God didn't ordain that child's life. God still wanted that child to live, or he could have made it not happen. He gave him life for a reason. <clears throat> so Abraham goes on to say, God that Ishmael might live before thee. In my version, it's, God, what about my son Ishmael? So you're going to give us a, ba a baby, and you're going to make this baby do all this great stuff. But what about Ishmael? Is he no good? Is he not worthy? Is he not special? Because he means something to me. Because I care about him. Because I want something good to happen to him. And God said... Sarai, thy wife, shall bear a son indeed. That's going to happen. And you're going to call his name Isaac. And I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant. And with the seed after him. And as for Ishmael, I've heard thee. He heard. Isn't this interesting? He heard his prayer. He helped God out. Ishmael wasn't God's best. That wasn't the way God set it up. That wasn't what God designed. It isn't. God's not turning a blind ear to him and saying, Well, you did it your own way. You made your bed and lie in it and walk away. Not one bit. Not one bit. No, the God that we worship, the God that we love, loved Abraham enough, heard his prayer to say, You know what? I have blessed him. He didn't say, I'm going to bless him. He said, I have blessed him. This kid's already well on his way. And I will make him fruitful. And I will multiply him exceedingly. Twelve princes shall he beget. And I will make him a great nation. But my covenant I will establish with Isaac, which Sarah shall bear unto thee at the set time in the next year. I heard you, Abraham. I heard you don't believe me. I heard you've been waiting. And I heard you want a blessing for your other son. And he will be blessed. 
and he will have a nation, and he will multiply, and he will be great, but my exceptional purpose for what I want to come from you will come from Isaac and come from your wife Sarah, because that's my perfect, that's what I want from you. That's what I have set up, but I'm not going to turn a blind eye to your other child. Absolutely not. And you're going to have this promise this next year. He hears us. He hears our cry. Not a secret. Not a secret at all. He didn't hold his mistake against him. Sometimes I think that we get so caught up in our mistakes that we can't possibly let God in. We, we want to look at Him, we want to worship Him, we want to do something, but we have a part of us that we feel like is so unworthy that we can't ask Him to take that from And we almost feel like we'll never be able to have His best because of it. You know, sometimes there's not an exact scripture in the Bible that says, hey, no matter who you are, what you've done, and how you behave, this is what God will do for you. It doesn't say it like it. It just doesn't. But <coughs> that's why there's so many parables. That's why there's so many stories. That's why there are so many different aspects of so many different lives, because he wants to show you. My dad used to tell me, actions speak louder than words. And I think the best part of the Bible is God showing us in actions what He wants from us, what He'll do for us, how He'll provide for us, how He wants to bless us, how He hears us. He hears our prayers, whether we're worthy or not. If there's anything you take from today, take the fact that He hears your prayer, whether you're worthy or not whether you're justified, sanctified, whatever you want to call it, he hears it. The greatest gift is in obedience. He definitely wants to bless you more when you're walking in the right path. But that's common sense. Think about it with our, our, our own lives. And I, I, I throw my kids, this is a great scenario. If I ask my kids to make their bed, and they get up, and they make their bed, it's so much easier. It's just so much easier. If I ask them to take out the trash the first time, you guys have probably never had to repeat anything. Sometimes I've had to repeat a request or two at my house. If I ask them to take out the trash the first time, and they go and they do it, I'm more willing to bless that obedience. Absolutely. Absolutely. I want to give them, because I want to foster that behavior. So it's only natural, only common sense, that if you are walking with the Lord and you're following His direction, you say, Lord, I am going to do your best for me, that you're going to see a greater hand of favor. There's no doubt. But that doesn't mean the hand of favor is withheld when you're making a mistake. Or if you made a mistake. Every one of us in this room have done something we really wish we wouldn't have done. It's just the way it is. Because we're not perfect people. We're weak. In our weakness, He makes us strong. We're not perfect people. That's the beauty of it. He knows that. That's why He's already heard the blessing. So He always hears us. But we get to come as we are. We just get to come as we are. We're, we're natural every day. Don't need to put on a show. He's not expecting something else. It's the beauty of our church. We're not putting on a show. We're just who we are. How we show up is how we show up. He's actively listening. And His promises are true. The Bible's promises are true. You have to accept it. You have to say, okay, I get it. The promises are true. And if you're carrying out your purpose, Christ's ears are wide open. And if you're walking a little out of that purpose, his ears didn't change. He didn't move a direction for you. Isaiah 41, 17. I'll say it again, Isaiah 41, 17. 
He says, when the poor and needy seek water, and there is none, and their tongue faileth for thirst, I, the Lord, will hear them. I, the God of Israel, will not forsake them. That's a promise. You take that home, you take it to heart, you read it to yourself a hundred times. That's a promise. His promises are true. And he says, in my rendition, when it's hard, when it's hopeless, and you have nothing else, I hear you, and I will not forsake you. It's easy to just say, oh yeah, you know, he'll never leave us or forsake us. We all love to say that. And, and we love to encourage somebody until we're going through it. When it feels like you're hanging from a cliff and you can't hold on, it's a whole nother world. A whole nother world. I, at one point in time, decided I was going to try chewing tobacco. I was about 18. And I said, no, I said about 18 because I can't quite remember. But anyway, we, my cousin and a friend of mine, we go up to the mountains because that's the place to try chewing tobacco. And we get about 200 feet up this cliff. As we're chewing and spinning, we just, boy, we, we're men. We haven't figured out to that mountain. It started going like this. I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm going to die. I'm going to fall off this. And my cousin and I are holding on to each other, bear hugging each other. Oh, oh, we're so sick. We thought we were, and I said, okay, Lord. I hear you now. <laughs> I, hear, I will not chew <laughs> if you get me off this mountain. If you get me down, I will never chew. I will be obedient. And that is that. Why do I say that? I understand what it's like when you are clinging on. That's what I'm talking about with the promise. When you're not <coughs> sure if you're going to die or not. When you're not sure if you're going to make it or not. When you made the mistake. When you screwed up, he's, wait a second, I'm here, I heard you, I heard you, and I'm not going to forsake you, and thank God he didn't, because I was scared, it took me like three hours to get down, I'm done, it was a bit of a mess for me, but I held true, I, I, I don't do the chewing thing, I'm not condemning it, I'm just saying, I, I don't do it, man, because I don't want to get the spins again, but he's not waiting on you to be perfect, he's not. Perfection is, is when we're in heaven. That's perfection. Until then, he knows. He knows how it's going to go. It's, again, look at your own kids. You give your kids a task, you know. I ask them to sweep the floor. I cannot expect that floor to be perfect. I can't. I, I appreciate it if it's really close. But I can't. My expectation is, has to change. Well, God's there for us. It's the same thing. His expectation's different. But, He is waiting for you to call Him. He is waiting for you to cry out to Him. He wants to hear your voice. He wants to hear your cry. Isaiah 65, 24. I'll say it again. Isaiah 65, 24 says, And it shall come to pass, that before they call... I will answer. And while they are yet speaking, I will hear. He's already heard us. He's already listening. He knows you're going to call. He's waiting for the call. But he's already heard the need. Now, none of you parents in here have probably ever known when your child needed to be changed, needed to be fed ahead of time. You probably never knew it until they started crying. Or, it may have been like us, where we're like, oh shoot, we forgot to change, now she's going to cry, she's going to cry. And you run across the room and get that taken care of. I get it. He heard us ahead of time. He hears us. He's still waiting for our voice. He's waiting for our cry. But he's not going to do it. There's a promise. There's a promise that you can take to the bank. It's going to happen. He has you. So I want to read Joel chapter 2, verses 28 to 32. It's a lot. Joel chapter 2, 28 through 32. It says, And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. 
Your young men shall see visions, and also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. What's he talking about? This is the spot where he's talking about you walking in that, that light. Walking in his best. What he has for you, what he wants for you, he's <laughs> saying, hey, you walk in this path, and you're going to dream dreams. I'm going to pour out my spirit. Your sons and daughters are prophesy. Good things are coming. It will happen. It didn't say in here that you're not going to have a few stressors. It didn't say that you're not going to have some hard times. But it did say that good things are coming. And he says that I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth. Have you ever been able to sit back in your own life a couple of times and go, wow, I know that was God. That's a wonder. That's a wonder. That's something great. Blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood. Is that saying? This is when he's talking about the future. What's coming? He says, before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. There's another promise. Take it to the bank. It's not a secret. It's not something new. I repeat it a hundred times because when you're clinging on the edge, and it's hard, and you're not sure where you're going, he said, if you call on my name, you're going to be delivered. Another promise. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance. As the Lord has said, and in the remnant, whom the Lord shall call. He heard it. He promised it. Now just go do it. Will you please stand with me? <laughs> we as the Car Community Church will always present Christ's open doors of heaven to everybody. If you'd like to make Jesus your Savior, simply say, Jesus, I'm sorry for my sin. Come into my heart, and I will serve you with all my ability. If you prayed this prayer, we believe you have begun the Christian transformation. If you want to know more or simply like prayer, feel free to come up during the last song. I'm happy to pray with you. Lord God, Father, we just come to you. Jesus, we thank you that you hear our prayers. We thank you that you hear our cries before we cry out to you, Lord. I ask you, Father God, to put a blessing over everybody in this room, people watching, Lord. Hold everybody so close. Protect our thoughts. Help us to remember your promises for us. Remind us, Lord, of your unfailing hand as we work toward your anointed goal. Pour your favor on us, Lord, as we take on this week. Lord, remind us of your miracles every day. I thank you for your grace in surrounding us with your love. Bless everybody's week. In Jesus' name. Amen.